Hey kids, welcome to part two of our unit on how the government works. Last time we talked about the Articles of Confederation and why they failed. This time we're talking about how the Constitution was created and those founding fathers, how they're really just a bunch of problem solvers. So get out your lightsaber and get ready to use the force because today you are becoming my Padawan learner. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not your father. The essential question, what problems did the Founding Fathers face when creating the Constitution, and how did they solve them? As we talked about in our last video, the Articles of Confederation were causing real problems for the nation. They couldn't print money of value, solve disputes between states, collect taxes, or anything else that required power. How could a new and more powerful government be created without the citizens who fought for independence from a king becoming scared the new government would be powerful enough to take away their rights? It would have to be a government that had power to make states work together, while at the same time, a government with limits to its power. In 1787, a group of American leaders would meet in what would be known today as the Constitutional Convention. We'll be called this because it was at this meeting that the Constitution that we have today would be created. When the convention starts, two groups bring plans for a new government. One plan represents the desires of the large states. This plan was introduced by Edmund Randolph from Virginia and would be known as the Virginia Plan. The second plan introduced would represent the desires of the small states and was introduced by William Patterson of New Jersey and would be called the New Jersey Plan. This seems like a great place for a compare and contrast. Let's talk about what these two groups had in common first. Well, first of all, they both separated powers into three groups so that no one person or small group would have all the power. One group would be called the legislature. This group would make the laws for the country. The second group would be called the executive branch. This group would make sure the laws were carried out. Finally, they agreed there should be a judicial branch. This group would make sure that the laws were carried out fairly. Now remember, under the Articles of Confederation, there was no executive or judicial branch. So both groups agreed there were some major changes to be made. The Virginia Plan called for a bicameral legislature. This means that the lawmaking body was made up of two different groups of people. They also believed that large states should have more votes than small states. So the bigger the state, the more powerful it is. And when I say bigger, I mean by population. They believe that the House of Representatives should be voted for directly by the people. And they believe the members of the Senate should be elected by the House, the first group. So the people would select one group and that group would select a second. Now, New Jersey had a different idea. First of all, they wanted a unicameral legislature. That means one group of people who made the laws. In this legislature, all states would have one vote. Very simple, very clear, and all states would be equal. Not all people, all states. This legislature would be appointed by the state legislatures. That means that the state governments would decide who would represent them in the national legislature. This meant that no group would be voted for directly by the people. And this is a big difference between the Virginia and New Jersey plans. They both wanted to create a government with limited power. As you can see, both groups came with some good ideas and some not so good ideas for how to create a government with limited power. Both plans took the power and spread it out over three different groups of people. This means that no one person or small group had all the power. At the same time, they had big disagreements. Should larger states have more power than small states? To put this in modern terms, should the state of Oregon, with its 3 million voters, have the same amount of power as California with its 18 million voters? Or should the large state of California have the right to tell Oregon what to do just because it's a bigger state? This major disagreement seemed impossible to solve, with larger states wanting more power and small states wanting all states to be equal in power. Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth from Connecticut came up with a solution. This solution would be called the Great Compromise and would take ideas from the New Jersey and Virginia plan to create a plan that all could agree to. First of all, it would take the idea of a bicameral legislature from the Virginia plan, one of the groups of the legislature would be called the House of Representatives. This group would be elected directly by the people, and larger states would get more representatives and thus more power than small states. The second group would be called the Senate, which would make small states equal to large states, with all states getting two votes. Instead of being elected by the people, the senators would be appointed by the state governments. This would be changed when the 17th Amendment in the early 1900s would require direct elections of senators like the representatives in the House. The last part of the compromise stated that all bills or proposed laws that deal with raising money, aka taxes, have to start in the House and not the Senate. Now altogether, this compromise addresses the desires of the large states to have more power as they are given more votes in the House, and the desires of the small states to not be told what to do by the large states. Wow, what a plan. 
But as great as this plan was, it would not solve all the problems they faced at the Constitutional Convention. Even though the Civil War wouldn't happen for another 73 years. Slavery was already dividing the United States into the North and the South. Countries around Europe and the rest of the world were recognizing that slavery was evil and outlawing the practice within their borders. In America, however, slavery was being used in the South to create huge amounts of wealth for the plantation owners. Southern slaveholders saw slavery as a practice unique to their way of life and had no interest in giving it up. In the North, however, there were many wanting to outlaw the practice. At the convention, delegates from the North suggested this was the perfect time to forbid importing slaves from Africa. When delegates from the South heard this, they threatened to leave. The delegates from the South, many of which were slaveholders themselves, wanted to insert into the Constitution a provision stating that the government would never be allowed to outlaw or tax the international slave trade. Delegates from the North would never agree to that, so a compromise had to be made. The compromise would be a 20-year ban on any taxes or laws limiting the slave trade. But slavery was also a problem when deciding whether slaves would count as population, when deciding on how many votes southern states would get in the House of Representatives. Remember, in the House, larger states had more votes than small states, and this was based on population. Northern delegates made the point that slaves were legally considered property, and since they didn't have the rights of legal citizens, they should not be counted as population. Delegates from the North believed that if the South could count slaves, they should be able to count their livestock. Delegates from the South were enraged. They saw slaves as property that they were responsible for taking care of. They also knew if their slaves didn't count as population, the northern states would have many more votes in the House of Representatives than the South. Both sides were stuck once again, and another compromise was needed. This compromise was one that still leaves many Americans ashamed of the legacy of slavery in the United States. The compromise would be called the Three-Fifths Compromise, and would count every five slaves as three. Essentially, our original constitution defined a slave as three-fifths of a person. This turned out to be enough of a compromise to get the North and South to agree on how slavery would be treated in the Constitution of the United States. After the major difficulties were worked out, delegates voted, signed, and approved the Constitution. But that did not make it go into effect. Each state would need to convene in their own legislature and vote to approve the Constitution. Once 9 out of 13 states approved the Constitution, it would be put in place as the new government of the United States. This would turn into a major debate between the citizens of the United States. Those who were in favor of approving the Constitution would be called Federalists. Those opposed would be known as Anti-Federalists. Federalists believed the Constitution was good and it was needed with no new changes. They felt that the system of spreading out power and holding public elections would hold the government accountable enough to keep it from abusing its power because ultimately, the people were the ones in control. Anti-Federalists were concerned that a more powerful government could take away their rights. Some anti-federalists saw no difference between a king and a president, while others felt the Constitution was well-written, but was missing a major piece known as the Bill of Rights. The anti-federalists argued that people who lived under a king in England had a Bill of Rights, and so should Americans. Both sides made their arguments, and finally the federalists promised that if the states approved the Constitution as it was, the first thing they would do would be to add a Bill of Rights, protecting Americans' basic rights from the government. It was a good thing that they did, as the Bill of Rights had been used thousands of times in courtrooms to protect the rights of Americans since they were first created. Once again, compromise would bring about a solution, with Federalists getting the Constitution approved and Anti-Federalists getting a Bill of Rights to protect them from a more powerful government. So what? Well, if you can answer the following questions, then you learn, learn, learn what you need to know. What was the Great Compromise, and how did it solve the differences between the Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan? What impact did slavery have on the convention, and how was it resolved? Would you have been a Federalist or Anti-Federalist back then, and why? Tune in next time to find out about the legislative branch and how they legislate.